Hey everybody, here we are again, back in uh, the Woodworking Wisdom Workshops. Um, today we're going to look at potpourri, or oh, potpourri pots anyway. We have been looking at the, um, the the information or the before, and there's a few people saying that they've never made one. Well, welcome to the club. I've made one, uh, that one here. Um, so we're going to carry on and make one of these potpourri pots. We're using one of the, the kit lids that you can get, so... Um, one of those there. In fact, let's go to camera two just to have a look at the one that I have done before. Look, okay, there we are. Lovely little pot. This one. Um, I'm not going to tell you what the timber is. Might be nice if uh, we get a few guesses on the timber. So let me just give you a good look at this piece. We're going to do everything from the back to the front to the little markings to the base to all that sort of stuff. So, um, I've got Craig looking at all your um, all your comments. He's going to be the one that's asking me the questions. Um, and we've also got Ben on the, the camera. So he's going to be controlling all the cameras. So that's what we're going to make. Come, just, um, just let us know what your um, thoughts on the timber are. Um, it's not one of those timbers that you might immediately assume. So if you just say a timber name um or a single timber name you may not get it it's a variation of one of the common timbers so that's the one that i've done already i just wanted to make sure that everything was ready and in place for you they've got camera angles ready like that we're going to actually turn a beautiful piece um of brown oak okay go to number two there Benner. okay so a bit of brown oak beautiful bit of timber I'm not setting myself up in any way whatsoever because I know that this bit of timber is going to turn really, really well. So you can see at the moment I've got a single hole in the center. We're going to use a screw shut for that over a faceplate for obvious reasons. Well, it may not be obvious, actually. Um, the reason is that I don't want a load of screw holes in my way. It could impact this rim here. So we're just going to use a single um, uh, screw chuck. So we're going to go over that. I'm going to use my tail stop for the same reason. Um, because I'm using the screw chuck, it's not... It's not my my go to. Um, it's actually um, you, you know not as secure. For, I don't think it's secure anywhere near as secure um, as um, as using a faceplate. So um, can you come to number one there, Ben? Please. Um, it's not as secure as using a faceplate. So because of that, I'm going to put the tail stock on. Um, now we have been doing a few things since um, since last week. So before Christmas, me and Finn went up uh, the woods and we cut some blanks up, ready for to to be turning some big bowl blanks. So there's me slabbing um, some of this big ash. Um, and the only reason I'm showing you this is because this week. So go to the next one there, Ben. So this is preparing for our bowl blanks. I've seen a few forums where um, the assumption is made, especially as if you're beginning, you get your bowl blank from cutting the um, the timber into um, into rounds, but it's not strictly true. You need to, first of all, lop it down like I've done there, and then you cut through. So the actual bowl blank comes from the side of the tree, not the round of the tree. So this is why I'm showing you this. This is a couple of steals from before Christmas. But this week, on to the next one there, Ben. We uh, I was just prepping up. This is on the big 508 machine. Um, I'm prepping up some big bowls for you. So we're going to be doing some big wet bowl turning um, on a future uh, demonstration. That was that was what's happening this week. So, um, yeah. So now we're going to concentrate on some smaller bits to start with. Yes, yeah, so we got a question already. Well, a couple of suggestions on what uh, that piece of timber is. You posed a question. Oh, good afternoon, everybody. It's Craig here. Um, so, number one, frog fella, spotted sycamore. Uh, amazingly close, but no. Uh, Glenn Goodwin, uh, Ripple Dash. No. Steve is asking, is it pear? No. Malcolm, Ambrosy Maple. Oh, even closer. <laughs> uh, uh, and then we've got a, um, then we've got a question. What size is the blank, please? The size. I'm going to actually that the one that we've done there, I felt was a bit big. So what I'm going to do, so that one there. That was just under the seven inches, so about 175 millimeters. The one that we're doing is starting off, so that's 190, so about seven and a half. I'm going to take this down. I'll probably take an inch off of that, so about 25 mil off of that. Um, so just to make it a bit small, I just felt it was a little bit too big. So let's screw this one on. So remember what I said about screw chucks. You think about it, a screw chuck has one fixing. Okay, so it's quite important to support it. So I'm screwing on there with one fixing. 
Um, let's say, for instance, I make a big catch. Um, can I have a picture and picture? I just so I can talk to people. I feel I'm talking to someone. If you can see me, then I can see you, sort of thing. Um, so there was single fixing. If I had a big catch, potentially that's that fixing could rip out. So I'm just going to start off by holding the bowl blank with the tail stock as well. I can get rid of the tail stock in a minute. That's no problem. But we'll start off in that way. Um, dust extraction is going to come on when I start sanding. But initially, I'm just going to take off the outside edge, take some of that extra away. Okay. More, my list looks like more suggestions for the timber. Uh, yes, it does. Um what have we got? What have we got? We've got apple. Is it apple? No. Nope. Okay. Quilted maple. I'm going to give it to quilted maple. Yeah, it's actually so that's Steve. Well done. It's actually field maple. Where are we? Go to overhead there, Ben. It's actually field maple. So um, one of those gnarly old trees, the overgrown trees you see in hedgerows, those sorts of things. But there's a lot going on in that bit of timber. You can see these these lovely burrs, um, dead knots the ripples that are in it. It's a, it's a pretty, pretty bit of timber. Quilted, ma um, quilted maple's close enough, absolutely. Filled maple is, is ex exactly what it is. There is some spalting on the edge as well. So there's a huge amount going into that, you see. Okay. Now, what's why we're here? Look, I have decorated the back. We've got a little bit of decorating elf going on there. So we'll do that. We'll have a look at a decorating elf. Take off a little sacrificial foot that I'm about to make in a minute. Haven't sanded the inside. I'm not bothering. All right, so there's no, there's no need to. Um, I'm, we're going to put potpourri in the middle there, um, and uh, we won't ever be seen. I'm not going to worry about it. Absolutely fine. So we can get away with that bit. So let's, before I start, let's uh, answer another question. Uh, just a quick question from Glyn. Why don't you have uh, the, the, the dust hood connected to your extraction pipe there? Why don't I have the dust hood? That comes, I'm guessing you mean the one that comes with the stand. Um, I find I prefer stay put hose. Stay put hose, you get in a meter. Um, and the reason I prefer it, I can wind this down to make it smaller. Um, I can wind it out to make it bigger. I can direct it where I want to. And as you know, if you're working on a lathe, the closer you can get with your extractor, the better. Um, so that I can get really, really close. It's plastic, not metal. Um, so I can direct it better. That's what I find uh, works more. So, okay, let's start turning. Lay speed to zero. You know that's important. I've done this so many times with you. Lay speed to zero. Then we can start the lathe up. Um, and in terms of speed, I can give you the speed that I'm going to be turning at, but not necessarily the speed you're turning at, because I don't know whether your bulb blank is balanced. I don't know what your ability is. I don't know um, how sharp your tools are. There's so many things, so many variables within that. So I can give you mine, and if you're ever unsure... This blank being just under the, the eight inches, so seven and a half, don't go above a thousand. This is just stick safe. All right. Um, so I'm now turning up the speed and just checking the lathe, making sure things aren't moving around too much. That's 900. I'm just going to skim the outside edge first. And we're just going to take off a little bit of a little bit of the excess remember i said i want to make this blank a little bit smaller I'll just stop the lathe just for a minute. I just want to move the tool rest and tidy up a little bit of that front surface before we stop. But look how wonderful the color is on there. Just go to number two. Lovely. Look how wonderful that color is. It's really, really nice and brown. Okay. Okay. So now let's just do a little bit of tidying up of this front face. I'm just going to put my hand up here to protect myself from flying shavings. There we are. My foot's going to be roughly there. Don't worry, we will measure it accurately. Okay. 
So we're going to measure accurately in a minute. I've just put a rough pencil mark just for the moment. And now I want to remove some of the bulk material. I'm doing that before I take the tail stock away. All right. Questions? Yeah, we've got a couple of questions, if you don't mind, sir. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the first one, what, what wood is that again? This is brown oak. Brown oak and the yeah. original one. The original the one, top. we found out that was field maple. Okay. So we had a guess of, of quilted maple, which was close enough. So field maple, that one. Okay. Yes. And a message, uh, a question from David. Um, can Colwyn explain in depth in future episodes the reason for choosing particular centers drive centers yeah evolving centers or not choosing particular centers yeah, for absolutely particular jobs i think that'll make a good um uh, day's demo that one um yeah absolutely um we can look at different size um projects we can look at different types of projects so yeah we can look at why we would use a four prong over a two prong over a pro drive the tail stock center why a single point over a ring center friction drives all those sorts of things so i think that would be a good one yeah probably not a project one but we can go through several um uh, points of a project to explain it yes thanks david i suspect it was you may have asked that before christmas i just vaguely remember that question coming up now so apologies for that yes it will come up okay well, one more. A few more. Yeah, a few more. Go on, then. A few more. Uh, message from Joe. A question from Joe. Did you add oil where the wood contacts the tailstock centre? Did you want to put a little drop on that? No, no. If, you've got, if you're having to do that, I suspect that's because you've got a fixed centre in the tailstock, not, not one that moves. So go ab above, Jace. So what we're dealing with here, these are um, bearing centres. So they actually move with the timber. If you're creating friction with a, a fixed center, it's not the right center for your um, for your tail stock. That would be a friction drive for the headstock. So you need to get yourself something with a bearing in. And it doesn't matter whether your lathe is a one, two, or three mils taper, you can find them. Um, I don't have an example here. Well, yes, I do. So let's just have a look at, at this center just for the moment. Now, this is a fixed center. There's no bearing in there, but it's got no spurs on it. This is still a friction drive. It's designed for the headstock, not the tailstock. So if you've got something like that, it's just not designed to go into the tailstock. It, it will create, as you probably found, um, a heat, so friction, burning, charring. Worst case scenario, it chars a hole that, that then um, means the piece comes off the lathe. So make sure, and also huge amount of noise as well, and screeching. So that's a headstock drive, not a tailstock one. Yeah, there's more. Okay. Um, a question from Hodgepodge. When planning the shape of that completed pot, the maple pot, mm. did you use the wood grain feature to help aid the shape? For example, stopping at the OD just to keep that spalted area intact? Do you know, I didn't. Be, I, originally, I was going to take that spalted area away because there's a little bit of worm in there. Um, but as I was turning it, the colours came out, that spalting came out. So in a way, yes, I suppose um, the design did have a bit of, um, uh, impact from the timber. Um, originally, I wouldn't do that. Um, I would maybe turn the blank around to, to, to get the best bit higher. Um, but in terms of shape, I have a fixed shape in my head. I had a bit of research before. That was my... I, well, I tell a bit of a lie. That I say that was my first one that I turned. It's, it's not strictly true. The first... I did do a few of them around about 30 years ago but I haven't done many since then. So I've done a bit of research online, looked at different forms, different shapes, and went with that one. And I found that one for, for a decoration, a piece, of, a piece of turning just showed off the, the, the lid a bit better than having a, a, a very narrow, flat-faced one. Um, so that was the reason that I went for that, that sort of curve. We'll do something similar on this one as well. And what kind of thickness of material are you working with there? So <coughs> the thickness... Thickness of the maple one there is two and a half inches, which is just over the 60 mil. This one, by the time it's finished, it's going to be the same. It's two and a half inches finished to be around about that that same size. So 65-ish mil um, and two and a half inches. One more from Glyn. Uh, nice, nice question. Um, can you ask Colin if Vicky, Finn, Charlie are okay? We've not seen them for a while. <laughs> um, they're really, really well. Yes, absolutely. Finn's working on uh, plans for me still. He's at home doing that at the moment. 
Um, and yeah, the boys are in the workshop with me on weekends filming uh, other videos and things like that. So yeah, no, they're all they're all busy. Thank you very much for asking. And they're really interested still in what's going on here. Yeah, um, and just one more that I've got to put out there. You're bound to like this from Hodgepodge again. Um, 30 years ago, what were you like, 10 years old then? <laughs> mm, if only you knew. <laughs> Thank you very much. Anyway, before my ego gets too big, let's carry on. So let's take some, let's just rough some of this away first. So we're at nine, I can up the speed a little bit. We're at 920 then. So I'm just going up to 1200. Let's just take this back corner away. Now we did go over push and pull cuts last week with the bowl, but um, here it's just the same thing. I'm doing a pull cut first. It won't be a good clean finish. So we'll clean the finish up with a, with a push cut in a minute. And the back curve is far longer than the front one. So just a slower curve on the back. There, I'm going to leave that for the minute and remove the tail stock. We may, well, in fact, let's take that tail stop right the way away now. We're fine center. We can see center, but we'll clean up that center. Speed is fine. We know nothing's vibrating too much. So if I just clean this up, this is going to be sacrificial foot. Same way we used the sacrificial foot last week. It will be taken off and cleaned up later. And in fact, we're going to decorate the underside of this one. So there we are. That's a clean finish or ish, tidy finish. Now I'm going to mark, uh, that's the wrong one. I'm going to mark my foot. So speed sizer, internal grip I want to make. I'm looking for a C, set that to the center. That's the inside of my C jaws. If you haven't got a speed sizer, they are so efficient and quick at sizing your jaws. There we are. Passing tool just to cut the foot. There we are. And then all I'm going to do now is just use a skew as a scrape, a, a flat scrape. Because this area here is going to be the actual base. So I just want that fairly tidy. And now I'm going to do a finishing cut here. So let's just adjust the tool rest a wee bit, just around. So a push cut now, we're making the bevel rub. Remember, the main pressure is up the length of the tool, not pulling with your forward hand. The minute you pull with your forward hand, the bevel's going to leave the timber, which obviously we don't want. There we are. That's absolutely fine. If I now move the tool rest around and again, just take a little bit out of that back edge. Yes, another question. Yes, uh, David's got a query about jaws. Mm. Um, I can see the, all the advantages of the 50 mil OD. Oh, 50 mil OD, I presume he means O'Donnell's. Yeah. Um, but why would I also want C jaws in an SK114? And what do they give me that the O'Donnell's doesn't i'll show you when uh, what the c jaws look like in a minute when we take this off but the difference between the ods and the c's if you think about the ods um especially the 50 mils they have 
they have um, a dovetail on the inside rather than a, a tooth. So for um, dovetailed recesses um, and feet, they're going to give you, um, uh, you know, give you that dovetail. The other thing, and especially if you're doing smaller bowls, smaller pots, um, these, because they're tapered, they give your hands a little bit more um, uh, more movement, more, more. Uh, you know, you can get your hands behind the bowl. You think about sea jaws, um, I'm gripping there. I can't get my fingers down in there. But with these on, the bowls here, this, this is relieved away. So you'll be able to get your hands around it more. It just throws the piece away from the jaws a little bit more. Um, however, the C jaws hold all the things like the faceplate rings, the screw chucks. If I want a really secure um, a grip for things like uh, vase shapes, um, goblets, egg cups, that sort of thing, then I'll go tend to go with um, uh, the C jaws. So there's, they are different uses. Um, and you can get a little bit, bit more purchase, I would say, on those C's as well. Yes, great. And do you remove more wood uh, per cut with a pull cut than you do with a push cut? Um, NG seems yeah. to uh, have better luck with a push cut. Yeah, well, both really. It depends on what you're doing. So if, say, for instance, you're doing the inside of a bowl, a pull cut won't work because you're against the grain. You'll be you put, um, hitting end grain. So you have to push cut. And then to be quite honest, you can cut the width of your wing on your gouge, especially on wet timber. Um, but on a pull cut, I find the actual roughing process much, much quicker. Um, so if I'm doing bowls, for instance, it'll always be a pull cut on the outside, push cut on the inside, and a finishing push cut on the outside when you're, when you're done with your shape. And one more from Designing Man. <coughs> How would you turn uh, a vase or a goblet without a chuck? As uh, he struggled with that chuck. Um, so what you could do, turn between centres, um, and then you can use a friction chuck, jam chuck. So you saw the fruit demonstration we'd done way back in, I think it was on 12th of January. Um, so go make yourself a jam chuck, fruit chuck, attach that to the lathe with a face plate. So you make a single sided jam chuck, hollow all the way through, push out stick. So once you've done your shape of your vase, then you can tap it into um, your jam chuck, drill and hollow out gently, flip them over. So tap them back out, flip them over and do the underside, do your base. Nice and easy. All right. And just one more um, from uh, Woodwork Learner. On a small chuck like the SC2, what holds the bank better, a tenon or a recess? A small, so the, we're talking, uh, so right, record chucks. Now, I'm not, I'll be honest, I'm not familiar with their chucks. But if, if we're talking small chucks, um, then if you're beginning, um, in your turning uh, journey, then an expansion would be a bit better if it's a, if you're comparing dovetails with each other. So it, it, it's internal dovetail against an external dovetail. Go in expansion, expand into a recess. As long as you've made that recess foot um, wide enough that it doesn't split, then you'll probably say for a, a, your early stages doing that. You'll get to a point in your turning where you want to remove feet or have the ability to remove feet so your design can... Um, have a flow so you can get rid of it. It's just not dictated by the hold method, for instance. At that point, then your foot is going to be the best thing. It's not like I'm doing here. That foot is only there for one short period. Once I finish the bow, I'm going to remove the foot. So that's why. Okay. Um, project ideas, really. Just a couple to run by you. Um, as a fan of German style turning, have you got any plans or would you like to do um, some kind of ring turning? where you do, do the animals in, in, in a kind of circular ring and then slice through crossing. Yeah, absolutely. That is, that's one of the projects that I'm aiming to do um, when I'm allowed to this Christmas. We started Christmas projects in September uh, this year and we got an awful lot in. Um, not as many as I want to get in. So there's still a bundle that we're going to do. Ring turning is one of them. And again, it's not something I've done a massive amount on, um, but we can certainly do some simple projects. The inside out turning that I'm doing next week is another one that we're going to do for Christmas when we get closer to it as well. So by the time August comes and I start doing the Christmas demonstrations, um, yes, we'll be um, looking at some of those. And uh, Ollie, any plans to do any projects with captive rings? Captive rings? I hate captive rings. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Of course we can. Um, um, ben and Jason will do a captive ring at some point, I'm sure. Yeah, no, I'm, yes, we will. Yes, we will. <laughs> All right for the minute.
Okay, right. Um, this is the thing you with, with with live demonstrations like this, asking for suggestions. You're, I'm going to have to turn things. I'm not overly keen on turning. So, um, yes, we will. Okay, so we're going to sand now. Um, that was a nice quick back section. Um, there's obviously going to be a little bit of reshape and resanding uh, when we do the front as well. But let's do as much as we can here. Mixture of hand sanding, rotary sanding, like we've always done. Dust extraction is going on. You should be able to hear me but not Craig. So we'll ask more questions when we turn the extraction off. So lay speed the same. So we're going to start with a 100 grit, actually, just to take away the worst. I won't do the base just yet. But I'm going to just do a little bit with this one, and then I'm going to have a look and see what's, what it's like. Is there any tears that we might need to think about? Now that dust is going down that extractor nicely. And you notice that I'm not wearing, I'm not wearing a dust mask because you need to hear what I'm saying. For that reason, I must have that dust extraction working well. At home, my dust extractor is a really, really efficient one. However, I'm still wearing my full face visor with, um, with dust collection or, or uh, protecting me from the dust is so important especially if you're intending to wood turn for a length of years several times a week it's all going to mount up there we are i don't think i'm going to need the rotary sander i think we're there already this is I, I wasn't wrong already when i said it's it's turning i know it's going to turn well and that's really looking after me so we're down to 400 grit already. I want to put a, a sanding sealer and a wax on this. So I'm going to put the sanding sealer on straight away. The sanding sealer is going to raise the grain. And don't worry, at this stage, I'm not worried about any, any excess or things like that because we've got the front to turn. Lines like this, I don't know whether you can see um, this line that's just on the top. This is a bit of torn grain. Um, that will disappear as I do the other side, the other bit of the curve. But this back side here, this is all fine. Actually, it's got some really pretty ripples on. When we put the wax on later on, you'll see that. So this jar contains my sanding sealer. It's a mixture of 50-50 um, cellulose sanding sealer. This particular one is chestnut. All I've done is diluted the 50-50 with cellulose thinners. Okay, done the same thing. So for me, 50-50 works. Um, cellulose tends to cut through waxy and oily timbers as well. That's another nice reason for you in it, using it. And I've diluted it so it dries a bit quicker, so I can crack straight on. And what sanding sealer is doing, it's, it's soaking into the timber. It's raising the nap, those very fine fibers. So when you put the wax on, the wax will stay nice and vibrant for a long time. Um, if you don't, what a, the wax just dulls after a few days um, as those fibres tend to stand up. It is a it is a preparation for your finish, though. It's not the finish. Even though, <coughs> excuse me, even though it looks beautiful, this is just your prep. So let's just do a little bit of just wiping off the excess. It's already soaked in far enough, and it's already drying. I know that because I can smell it. <coughs> Okay, I don't want to turn the lathe on too soon, otherwise that, this is a basically a dense sponge. If I turn the lathe on too soon, I'll get a face full of sanding sealer. So nice and slow, 600 grit abrasive, and just sand the surface, because the nap of the grain has now risen. We're just going to smooth it down, ready to take a good finish afterwards. There we go, that's all we need. Don't worry, you'll find a few scratches doesn't matter absolutely no no odds at this stage at all because it's only the six under scratch you're scratching the sanding sealer not the timber um so that makes no problem um now we can turn this over and if you're going to do a batch of these what i would do is get to this stage before you move on because it just means that you can keep your um your, your screw chuck in the chuck rather than keep taking things out putting things back in again just get as many as you're doing to that stage, then you can take your screw chuck out and carry on. 
just use a wooden packer. The, the screw chuck screws aren't adjustable, so you just make them adjustable by packing them out. As you can see there, <coughs> there's quite a long screw on that one. Okay, so we've just used a little wooden packing. It could be anything, plywood, MDF, any, any scrap bit of timber that you got, um, as long as it's even, um, just to pack it out. But there, the side of the, um, the screw chuck is ridged. And that neatly fits in the size of the side of our C jaw, which again has a little tooth on them, and that just locks, just locks in there. Yes, Craig. So a couple of questions, um, Dave. What makes that brown oak? Is it a particular species of oak? A particular uh, part of the tree? <clears throat> no, no. Good, uh, good timed question, actually. Um, so brown oak is uh, it picks up minerals. I mean, we used to call it tiger oak. Um, and you can force tiger oak. The, the way we used to do it, and when I say we, as, as an apprentice, um, I was taught how to do this by when well, we used to dry our timber. It was in a barn and we had a ready source of turkey muck. And so you put your wet boards, stand them up on end and spread turkey muck around the bottom. And then it draws up um, all the nitrogen and it, it uh, reacts with the tannic acid in the timber. And so you get those brown streaks. If it's growing in that sort of area or anyway, that sort of those sorts of minerals it's picking up, it's going to be brown. Exactly the same with chestnut. You can force chestnut to do the same thing. So yeah, so go and find someone that's breeding turkeys or chickens, whichever. Yes. And just one more question from Martin: Can you use the grey web racks rather than a brazier? You can. <laughs> yes, you can. I'm. I'm. I'm not a massive fan of wire wool on the lathe big safety issues and also the what we've just mentioned about the tannic acid in a lot of timbers um, metal will react with the the timber um, oak chestnut yew olive teak all of those timbers are, react really badly the fruit timbers for instance cherries are really bad one um, so yeah web racks is a good alternative um, I, for me I, it, even the finest of the web racks is still isn't fine enough doesn't go down fine enough really and um, when we're talking 600 grit it really is a lot lot finer than the finest web racks but no absolutely um if you if you like that it's a good medium to put um, waxes on with uh, dave just mentioned that he's currently trying to spot beach in chicken poo yeah well you can use chicken poo but you also um yogurt and um once you've got it going then tomato fertilizer if you wrap it up with cling film as well that really helps that uh, think of the end grain if you can find some of the fungus the honey fungus just by lifting if you go for, uh, for a walk in the woods and you see any beach down just lift the um, bark and you will see the veins of uh, a fungus underneath if you put those on the end grains put your yogurt and your um, fertilizer on it then wrap it up um, but keep checking it because it, it's there's a fine line between spalting and going very very um, soft and, and pithy um, so check it regularly. Usually it's around about six weeks and you've got a good good amount of spalting. All right. Okay. Let's carry on. I've got a certain size that I'm going with um, for the lid of this potpourri because if I get the actual uh, lid out, there we are. You can see it's got some lugs on the back and those lugs just stop it from wiggling around in the hole that you make. So I'm going to um, measure that. It's seven T mil, I've measured that already. That's the size that we're going to go with. So 35 there. That's going to be the size of the hole we're going to turn at the minute. But before we do that, we just need to clean this surface off. So lay speed to zero, turn it on. I've checked the tool rest. There we are. So I'm back up to my 1200. Now I'm going to just rough that surface, gentle cut with a pull. There we are, we're about there. So just a little finishing cut in the centre. Mark my whip. We are going to check this in a moment. Now we're just going to take a small cut from centre. So I'm not going to go too deep.
I just want to make sure and confirm that we've got the right size for that lid. Now, before I get to the line, before I get to our line that I've marked, I'm just going to stop the lathe, and I'm about, probably about a mil and a half away from it. I'm just going to do a check, make sure, there we are, we are too big, which we were hoping. So if I now go up to the line, you, can, you know what it's like, you can always take a little bit more away, but you can never put it back. So now we cut that last little bit. Now look how far out I'm positioning that handle. I'm right the way over the other side of the lathe, because I want to aim my bevel back of the tool down the line I want to cut. Now, if you don't do that, if you start here, for instance, with the handle, the tool will generally sort of skip along the surface. So you need to present the bevel pointing direction you want to move. Right, so now I'm going to go to where I think my depth should be. We're going to do um, a little bit of work with the uh, carbide tip tools in a minute because I want to be able to cut in under that shoulder. I can't do that with the bowl gouge because the bevel won't be able to rub there. So we're going to cut back in um, with the with the carbide. Right, start looking at your shape. We are nearly there. A little peak right on top, but we've got some waste to take out yet. So I think we're almost there. And I'm going to do a little decorative rim on the inside at the end, just like this one. So we want to create this little this little beaded edge here. Just something you can decorate that with a texturing tool as well, um, or use something like a decorating elf, all sorts. So let's just take off this rim. And there's absolutely nothing stopping you. If you want to, said there is no, um, no project that we can't use a Coleman Way signature skew on. So here we go. So we're going to use it as a nice little scraper. Nice little negative rate scraper. Just to tidy up any little areas. That'll do us. Yes, questions. Yeah, I've got a couple of questions for you, Colin. Um, from Lawrence, are carbide tools better than high-speed steel tools for hollowing, especially if um, small hollowing is required? If more hollowing is required? Small. Small hollowing. Yeah. Um, carbide tip tool. Okay. So just go above on there, James. Well done. So we're using the round carbide tip tool for this project. However... There's so many um, tools out there. In terms of hollowing, if we talk about favorites, if I'm doing a big hollow form, for instance, um, then I want to be using something like my Woodcut, the Proformer, because they are um, they still have a bevel. They have a top bevel, um, top bevel um, that I can put deep into the vessel doesn't need to be near the tool rest so you can go really really deep on wet timber it works really really well you can do dry timber not quite as well though but you think that produces lots of shavings if you're doing a vessel with a very small opening you don't want shavings inside because they, they're really difficult to come out so that's where i would use a scraping type hollower that could be carbide it could be high speed steel if we're talking again favorites um carbide tip tools you, you can replace the tips. They're not resharpenable, really. Um, so favourites, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm re honestly really torn. In my home, then I'll be using normal high-speed steel because 
I find that I can change the shapes a little bit more often. Um, with the the carbide tip tools, you've got the ability, like I say, just to turn the um, turn the, the the actual edge to get a sharp area again. So, standard view is what you're what you're doing a lot of. If you're doing lots of small net vessels, I would go with a probe carbide or high speed steel, just a movable tip. Yes, Greg. Sorry. Uh, that's okay. Um, message from or question from Bill on the push cuts with the bevel rubbing. Are you cutting with the points of the gauge or more on one of the edges um so we're, we're just below the very point if you look with the flute dead up right and put a line on the um uh, right in the middle and then turn it up to sort of your 10 o'clock or two o'clock depending what way you're doing your push cut you'll be just below that line the lower part of that that center yeah and one more question from maria in wales um she has a, a miniature solid bent hook type hollowing tool yep um how should she sharpen it um, if it's high speed steel, then the same as, as the, all the other tools, you can either go to your bench grinders to a CBM wheel, you can use a, a Tormek, or take your diamond file to it. So diamond file, something like a credit card type file, something like this. This is a DMT one, or the Axminster uh, fold away um, diamond files. They both work really well. Then you take those to whatever tool you're sharpening. I wouldn't be doing this with it, but I'll tell you what I would be doing. I would be doing this. Okay, so that taking that to the tool means that you can file quite easily. All right. We're going to finish hollowing the inside of this one. We're going to go straight to the carbide and we're going to side cut with this. Under control small cuts i want to cut this way if you look at the one that i've already done we're not going massively undercut it's just enough to show some depth in there okay so not a huge amount if it, again if i was at home i'd probably swivel my headstock around so i don't lean over the lathe quite so much um here we're just going to keep it just because of the camera angles and stuff like that we're going to keep it where it is check to make sure that i've got enough of that tool um, touching the tool rest and make sure you don't tilt. It's ever so easy when you when you go into something like this that you start tilting the tool up. It just feels natural, but it must remain flat. And small cuts. Don't take a big cut. We're going to come nice and gently out. And then work to centre and pull back. Work to centre and pull back. So I'm getting to that centre point and I'm bringing the tool back again. And here I'm not having to worry about a bevel, so I can actually point the chisel wherever I want it to go. Let's just have a look at that. See where we are. I want to make sure that I you get that nice little undercut. We're nearly there. I'm going to take a little bit more of a cut. All right. Okay, question before we carry on. Once we go back into the rest of this roughing out, I'm going to put dust extraction on. It's quite a dusty timber. Yeah. So Maria, just clarify which edges should be sharpened on the. Uh... Well done. Look at that. Well done. Where's me? What did I do with me? There it is. Okay. So what we're going to do is 
you can see the top of this particular tool. I'm going to play with the camera angles. There we are. So we've got a bevel underneath and we've got the top ground angle. That's the area you grind. You don't grind the shape unless you want to change the shape to, to, for another process. But all we're going to do is sharpen the top. So literally across that top edge. And this is the same sort of way that you would do something like a router cutter. You don't want to change the profile. You just want to sharpen the edge. So it's that top edge all the time. All right. Hopefully that explains that one. And uh, one more question from Robert. Um, can you demonstrate a peeling cut with your skew? And he goes on to say um, he's learned so much from watching these demos. Keep up the good work and thank you. So no, thanks for the thoughts, Robert. No worries. Thanks, Robert. Yeah, no, um, uh, not on this piece, but we have plenty. If um, you've, it sounds like, Robert, you've been, been watching quite a few of these. You know it doesn't take much for me to get uh, the skew out. Um, so in the next couple of um, videos, I think Inside Out Turning will have a, uh, a look at the skew again. Um, but absolutely, yes. Think when if you're practicing your skew chisel, there's plenty of videos you can go back and look at in this series. Um, but think about bevel rubbing, lay the bevel on first, present the cutting edge at 45 degrees to your top line, the top bit of timber that you can see, bevel rub, then slowly lift the handle and cut with the bottom half of the tool, not the bottom tip, the bottom half of the tool, and practice on um, scrap timber, softwood, that sort of thing. Just get that peeling cut going nicely. And it's the same both ways, 45 degrees that way, 45 degrees the other way. Push. Um, the chisel down onto the timber. Okay, it takes a bit of practice that when it doesn't come automatically. But there, all right, carry on just for a minute. Yes, Maria in Wales says thank you very much. Perfect. In Welsh. In Welsh. Oh, my goodness. Say. Go on. Oh no. <laughs> okay, a little bit more dust extraction, a little bit more hollowing. So find your center and then bring them out. And then just feel it around that inside corner. There we are. Now, I'm going to have a look at that before we go any further. Look with the fingers, because you're not going to get your eyes right up in there. Right, I've got a little bit of a lump right in the middle, and also one just as we come out. So we're going to take those away. There we are. That felt like it done it. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, let's have a quick look. What we've got, we've got a little bit of detail work to do now. So there, we've got a nice little under, uh, sort of under curve in there. So it throws the shadow around. That's what we need. We're not going to fill it with bundles of potpourri. We just want to put a little bit in there. So you've got some nice weight to it. So whilst we've got that weight there, I'm just going to curve a lip on the front. And we'll do that with a skew. And then we'll do a little bit of decoration. So skew chisel. I'm not going to roll any beads. All I'm going to do, use the point of the skew and scrape this bead around. Remember where we are. Because this is a, a bowl blank, the grain is running the grain is running down the piece. So if I try and roll a bead in the conventional way that you would on a piece of spindle work, then what tends to happen is the grain acts like a tram line and it will grab the skew chisel and pull you away. Um, so it's something to consider um, when you're doing this sort of shape. And to be honest, on side grain, scraping like this works really well. Now I'm going to put one more just to keep in line with what I've done before. If I put another little V cut there, just a V cut and tidy up the outer edge. Maybe roll that in, look. And then if we go for a small bowl gouge, I just want to create 
um, a little concave. Small bowl gouge or absolutely go for nothing wrong with using a, um, a scraper here around those. You could scrape that. My go-to tends to be a bowl gouge just because the finish is going to be slightly better. And a small one. This is a, a quarter inch or six mil. There we are. Just a, a little bit of decoration. That's all. And again, we're ready to sand. Dust extraction on all the same grades of, 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 of abrasive. So we go 100, 150, 240, 400, um, and then sanding seal. And then we can think about waxing. My favorite bit, waxing. So 100, 150, 240, 400. Dust extraction's on. You may not be able to hear it, but dust extraction's on, doing its job, taking that dust away from me. Now I'm going to sand up to the join, but I'm not going to go too far over because you find every abrasive grade that you now go to, you're going to have to sand a little bit further again. So you can see, I'm just supporting my arms really, making sure, making sure that I've got good control. If you sort of weak sand like this, not weak sand, probably the wrong way to put it. Lazy sand is a better term. Um, you, you'll find that all those nice, um, nice bits of detail disappear. So just support your arm. Just mold the abrasive to suit. I'm not worried about sanding the inside too much. I'm just going, to, just giving it a, a rough going over. Right, so that's a hundred grit. I'm just going to stop, double check, make sure we've got rid of any nasties. Nasties, I mean tears. There's a little tear right there that's got to go one right there so the top looks nice there we are so now 150 There we are, so now 240 grit. There we are. We'll just have a quick look at that, and then we'll put some sealer on. I want to make sure the join on the back 
isn't visible. So I want to make sure that there's no sanding marks left or anything like that. So, and that's pretty good. I'll be honest, that's not me. That's the timber that's made that nice and easy to sand. Questions, yes. Yes, just a question. It's just as pulled up the screen for a second. Um, question from Bill. Is the skew chisel a negative rake, uh, rake scraper when held flat due to the bevel angles? Yes, absolutely is. Absolutely. It's one of the finest that you'll ever get. Really, really fine scrape you'll get with that. Um, the only downside with a um, using a skew like this, especially um, especially one I was just using, is that they're very, very thin. And so you don't get a huge amount of strength. So you can't take a big cut. Not that you should be taking a big cut with a, with a, uh, a scraper anyway. But a, um, a prop, what I would call a proper scraper, including sh um, shear scrapers and negative rake ones, they are a lot thicker in the material than you're going to get on a skew most of the time. So that would be the only reason that I would go to um, a conventional negative rake. There we are. Wipe off the excess. Finn's watching, by the way, everybody. There was a question earlier asking about Finn, Charlie, and Vicky. Finn is watching. I'd be very embarrassed to know that I've just told you that. Say hello if you're there, Finn. Okay, so there we are. Just wiping off the excess. I've put no wax on this yet. You can put a bit of sealer in the middle if you want to. It's up to you. Those, um, uh, those oils will seep into the timber if you don't, obviously. Um, and help with the smell. And we are. That's pretty dry. Lay speed to zero and slow, slow, slow. And then we're going to very gently sand with the 600 grit again. There we are. Colin Maria is asking, um, is there a particular timber species you wouldn't use sealer on? No. No. I've never... No, there isn't. You might... Especially, I would go for, especially oily, waxy timbers, definitely get your sealer in there because it won't allow anything else to, to, to you know, create um, uh, a polish. So if you're using probably one of the most oily timbers, something like teak or a, an olive cellulose sealer will creep through it it will actually eat its way through that oil and create a good good seal ready for your polish so no i don't think so there's nothing i've i've come across yet that i wouldn't use it on okay bit of wax now i haven't used wax yet on many of these projects so we've used a lot of oil we could go to oil on this but i thought no let's get a wax that's a little bit shinier and we're using this one this is the axminster clear paste wood wax And the way we're going to use this, we're literally just going to apply it and wipe it off. So you can't get much easier than this. Now, a couple of weeks' time, we're doing a finishes for turning q and um, I'm going to base that around four different types of finish. Not makes. We're not talking make, uh, makes, brands. We're talking types of finish. So there'll be wax, um, there'll be sealer, there'll be oil, there'll be polish. Um, so make sure you get your questions ready for that. That's in a fortnight's time, turning Tuesday on a fortnight. Um, but for the moment, we're going to use this one. Um, I won't get too far into to waxes, but you can get waxes by colour as well as um, what they do. For instance, if I just grab one more from my shelf, I've got a microcrystalline restoration wax there. We've got the clear paste wax. Microcrystalline just means it's got a water inhibitor. It's not a, it's not a waterproof, but basically a water inhibitor just means the more handling you get, the more handling it gets, the less likely it is to tarnish, hence the restoration name. Um, you can get, this is a neutral wax. Clear waxes tend to be a slightly yellow in color. This is a neutral. So all over. You would reuse the um, different ones. So a white, for instance, this is a fairly dark timber, but it's behaving. If you're using a really dark timber, then a neutral white wax may not be good. You might see that wax in the pores of the timber. If you're using a very pale timber, a holly, a sycamore, a maple, then you might not want a yellowy wax because of the yellowing it can give. So you might want to go neutral. So they're all, there's all slight different reasons for using a different wax. And it depends on the project of the timber 
and your preference as well, really. Um, there we are. So now a little bit of just a, a handful of shavings. Handful of shavings. You can speed the lathe up a little bit now. And all this is nothing magic about doing the shaving or using shavings here. All this is is literally just taking off the excess wax. Okay, we're going to buff this in a minute with some clean tissue. But just take off the excess wax. Bit of clean, dry tissue. And this is your buff. Now, I'm not worrying too much. I can't get right up to the join between the pot and the chuck. So I'll do that when I do the base in a minute. It's not a problem. Okay. Right, there we are. That's enough. That's a pretty bit of timber. Yes, Greg, question. Yeah, question from Simon. Is it preferable to apply the wax uh, with the lathe stationary as opposed to it running? Always. Always, any polish really, apart, well, I say apart, I was about to say apart from friction polish, but I still apply that to the piece, then turn the lathe on. The reason being, if you think about, well, certainly thinners, uh, uh, cellulose sanding sealer, uh, dilute with thinners, all those sorts of things, you don't want them airborne, for one. But when it comes to wax, if you're applying with a lathe running, you're skipping across any deep pores that are in the timber. So apply it. Um, well, make sure it's sunk into all those little fissures, all those little bits of grain that you couldn't do with it running. Then turn it on, buff off the excess. Much, much more efficient that way. Um, let's go above there, Jason. Let's have a look at that lovely grain. Number two. That's it. Isn't that pretty? That's a lovely bit of timber. So we've got a little bit of work to do on the back. We're going to remove that foot. You don't have to. You can carry on and make your potpourri dishes with a foot like that. Absolutely fine. No problem. My preference is to take it off, that's all. So we've got two ways of holding this now. If that was any other size, then I would say make a wooden drive, so just a cone um, which you hold in your chuck and just turn that shape, and then use your tail stock on the, the back here. Hold it between centers like I did um, last week for the bowl turning exercise. However, it just so happens that those seed jaws are going to grip that really well. Hence the design. So again, another bit of tissue. And we can start with a tail stock. If you're at all worried about um, that coming off, that's a fairly thick lip on there. So I'm not too worried at all. Well, not worried at, at all. Wind that in. Make sure that fits over. There we are. And you're going to expand just enough. Remember what we said before. Stop just before you hear the first crack. Not after, just before. Yes, Greg? Steve's asking if you ever melt your wax into the grain with a heat gun. No, I don't. I don't. It's something I've, I've done. I'll tell you what I have done a lot of, though. And I get why you... You might do that. I've, I've used buffing wheels to, to buff that wax into the, the timber. That w really works well, especially if you're using a buffing polish. Um, but no, I've never melted it in. I'm not sure what the oils will, will do. The oils from the waxes will do the timber, whether it discolor or not. But um, if you've done it, then, then perfect. There we are. I'm just going to use the tail saw just initially. Just did a little bit of support. And then once we've taken most of that away, then we can just trim that last little bit. So a small bowl gouge, only a little quarter inch or six mil. Um, I've changed a lot of stuff on the lathe. So lathe speed back down to zero. Turn the lathe up. And again, I'm probably up toward the 1200 mark again. So a small bowl gouge, six mil, quarter inch. And we're just going to remove that foot. Okay. 
Okay, you can do whatever you want in terms of decoration on the bottom. There we are. So that I can't do any more now because the tool rest, the tail stock is in the way. So the tail stock comes up out the way. We can remove that last little bit. Just do a little feature on the bottom. We're going to use the decorating elf just to put a little mark there just to make it look a little bit more interesting when people pick the the piece up you can do whatever you want you can leave it flat if you wanted to so just making a little button in the middle there tidy up any areas there we are now i'm not going to use the decorating elf until i've sanded with some of the coarser abrasive so that's the extraction just a little bit supporting my hand so it doesn't slip and scratch that polished surface So then we can go to 150. So I'll have a quick look at, at that at this stage, and that's fine. Again, that Tim is looking after me. So 240. really really nice finish there it's not it's not making me work very hard at all i'll be honest so that little button in the middle will put a little bit of decoration in i'm just gonna ben could i borrow your brass brush or suede brush please and we're gonna use a little decorating elf this decorating elf has got a little spiral on it okay or a little little tooth we're, all we're going to do is let that uh, let that cut away. There we are. So that's that's great. A lovely little finish. Thank you, Ben. This is the brush Ben treats his loafers in the morning with. So you can sand the surface of that or deburr it with a little brass brush or suede brush. It's a bit of 400 or 600 grit. So once again, we're going to finish up now. I'm going to get my blue tissue ready because we're going to do a little bit of sanding, sealer and waxing. Whilst I'm doing that, we're going to answer some questions as well. Yes, great. Uh, Richard's asking, uh, could you have used a push plate to do that? Uh, it becomes because this the the front of this isn't um, isn't like a bowl. It's very smooth. That that outside surface, a push plate, there would be no sort of no key for it to lock in position um so i would go for instead of a plate a very slight dome and do the same thing put um, some route matting on that dome or sort of cone shape and that would be better certainly when it comes to anything hollow form that sort of thing that's what we do instead of push plates so yeah just a similar sort of um, process though yeah using the tail stock 
So I want to be careful. Now, I don't want this to drip and ooze around that wax surface. So I'm only sealing what I need to seal. Keep it spinning in your hand so it doesn't run down and then take off the excess immediately. There we are. And we're going to do the same thing. We're just going to wait a few seconds. A little bit of 600 grit abrasive at slow speed. Um, and then you wax again. And if you've got detail, like the, the little bits there that we've made with the decorating elf, or if you have little burrs, or little 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 fissures in the in the timber, and they get full of wax, then all you need is a little stipple brush. Just get one of your cheap brushes, and you can just get it out of all the holes that way before you start buffing. I won't bother going to shaving because there's not enough wax on there to worry about. So, yes, Craig. So, Cliff's asking, how do you uh, choose which hollowing tool to use? Um, to be honest, the size of the hollow form. This sort of thing lent itself to carbide scrapers because I didn't, I wasn't worried about going deep. Um, and the round nose of the carbide was was perfect for this situation. I didn't need to go too undercut, so I didn't need a swan neck, for instance. Um, but if I'm doing lots of wet, deep hollow forms, I would always go for a woodcut pro former. It's just my my go to. Unless, like we said earlier, unless you had a very narrow necked hollow form where shavings would become a problem, then you would need to go to a scraping type hollower, so the probe style, swan neck style. So you produce chips as opposed to shavings because those chips can then be poured out like a liquid. So that would be the only reason that I would do that. And that's, you know, that's my favorite method. There's lots of term turners um, that have, you know, many different methods, but that's what I prefer. So look, I, uh, well, camera, are we? There we are. So you can see that just a little bit of, of decorating there with the decorated elf. You can go as crazy as you want to um, with that. It's entirely up to you. Um, and let's finish him off, put the, put the lid back on. There we are. And we've got our, we've got our overhead. We've got our potpourri dish. All right, let's get to the other one. So you remember before we had our little piece of, of maple above, Jace, our bit of maple. And there we are. And our brown oak. So a couple of nice little projects, those. They don't, they're not particularly um, lengthy projects. Um, they're not particularly lengthy projects, but they are fun ones. They're nice little gift ones. And, and to be honest, apart from your bowl blank, the only extra expense is one of those. Okay, so really, really quite quite accessible. Um, C Jaws was throughout on that with a, with a screw chuck. So not loads and loads of kit either. Yes, we'll have another question. Yes, yeah, Steve's got a question. Um, what wax would you recommend using on Paduk? Um, only you can only find light color waxes, and they fill the pores, which isn't great. Yeah, uh, well, with Paduk, I would definitely go for a sealer first. Make sure you put your sealer on, wipe off the excess, um, and then go for a clear wax on the top of that. You don't need to. I would you know, avoid the neutral um, waxes, the white ones. You'll you'll have that speckle all over the place. So go for a, a clear wax, a yellow type. Um, it'll make it more vivid. It'll make it look richer. Um, you're not going to sort of d dull that uh, that finish uh, down at all. The same with any of those darker timbers. Go with a, a clear wax as opposed to um, as opposed to uh, the neutral, the white type. All right. Well, I think that's it for the day. That's another project down. Um, tomorrow we've got Jason um, flattening uh, sharpening stones. Um, and uh, like I said, in a couple of weeks' time, we've got that Q&A on finishes as well. So if you can start thinking about questions, and um, we're going to look at uh, wood-turning finishes, so we're going to concentrate on that. So before we go, we've got another question for another four questions. Uh, a few more questions, actually. <laughs> um, lots of love. Thanking you for the demonstration. So well done, Colin. Uh, I found it very interesting, so cheers. Um what question have we got next? Um, what do you hate turning? Um, can, can it be a future project? Oh, thanks, guys. Um, what do I hate turning? Well, I'll be honest with you. Um, one material that I really, really don't like turning 
but I find that are really popular, especially if you're making wooden fruit and things like that, are Banksia nuts. Banksia nuts are probably the dirtiest and and um, uh, most horrible thing to turn because they shed so much of that velvety outer skin. They fire seed pods at you and all those sorts of things. But when they're finished, they're lovely to look at. So that's probably one of my most unliked things, really. CP's got a suggestion. How about making a pot like that and the lid itself is, is a wooden lid with um, some scroll work? Nice collaborative. See, oh, that's something for Ben, isn't it? Absolutely. Maybe that's something that we'll do in the future. We do have, in March, a nice collaborative um, uh, project coming up, which was one of your suggestions. We wanted to have a look at um, making a bowl, then it being decorated. And in that project, we're going to use um, some carving aids on the lathe and take into the bench. Um, again, going back to our woodcut friends, um, and also some colouring and pyrography techniques as well. So that's one to look forward to in March. So yes. Uh, how about thread chasing? Thread chasing. Now that comes from somebody that's already seen me thread chase because we done, I don't know when it was now, probably the end of August, early September, we had a little venture into thread chasing. It was one of my first attempts and we had a 50% success rate. I was really pleased with the one that went well. Um, and uh, the other one went dismally wrong live um, on the stream. So yeah, maybe. I, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, bowling ball? Bowling ball. Well, we can turn balls. That's not an issue. That's not a problem. Um, yes, that will either be me, might even be Jason. We'll see. But yeah, balls aren't a problem once you know how to do it. Eggs and possibly hollow eggs. How about that? In about three weeks' time. Ooh. We're doing egg cup. I'll do an egg. And I've got an apprentice piece I made the first week of my apprenticeship, this was a little test from my boss at the time. I needed, he wanted to see me how well I could do a box and the join. Um, so he made, uh, had me do an egg, hollow it out and, uh, and look at the join. So I've got two of those to bring in as an example. We'll make an egg, we'll make an egg cup. Okay. All right. There we go. Thank you. There we are, guys. Thank you ever so much. Your support means a massive amount to us. You keep coming back, giving us suggestions like this. And without the questions, um, it would be a very short demo. So really, really good. Thank you so much. Don't forget, tomorrow, come back, see Jason, same time um, in the uh, Woodworking Wisdom Workshop, 3 o'clock. He's going to be flattening, um, sharpening stones. Um, thank you very much, and see you next week. Bye-bye.